I don't like calling it torture, right, for one simple reason. Because to call it torture says my guys were torturers, right? And they were told that they weren't. They were told that what they were doing was legal. And I'm going to defend my guys to my last breath. When al-Qaeda terrorists attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, Michael Morell was with President George W. Bush at an elementary school in Florida as the CIA's daily briefer. The events that unfolded on that fateful day are just some of the many national security emergencies the former acting director of the agency has been at the center of since 9-11. The veteran intelligence official has spent much of his 30-year career out of the public eye, but he's stepping out of the shadows to talk about his new book, the Great War of Our Time, the CIA's fight against terrorism from Al-Qaeda to ISIS. Vice News caught up with Morell at the Richard Nixon Library in Yerba Linda, California, and spoke with him about the Iraq War, the CIA's interrogation program, and what he refers to as the new era of terrorism. So you've just written a book. You spent 30 years essentially keeping secrets. Right. And now you're writing it all down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why? Why, a great question. I really debated this, right? with myself um, for a long time, you know, is it appropriate, right, for a former senior intelligence official to write a book? Um, certainly precedent, right, going back, to, going back to Helms and Gates and Tenet, they all wrote books, but I still struggled with this. And at the end of the day, I decided to do it for three reasons. The first was that I really do believe that this, this threat we face from this particular kind of extremism is gonna be with us for a long, long time. And I really thought it important that the American people understand the threat that we're facing, that it is going to be a generational one and what it's going to take to have to deal with it. And I thought it was important for them to hear that from me. The second reason is there are, there are a lot of myths out there about the agency. Um, you know, one of the myths is that we're kind of James Bond-like. There's another myth out there that everything we touch, we screw up. And there's also this kind of Jason Bourne myth that we're a rogue agency, right? That we do things without the oversight of the president, without the oversight of Congress. Few agencies have the kind of oversight that CIA has. And I wanted to give people a better understanding of what the agency is all about and what, what it's like there. And then the third reason, which doesn't get talked about much, uh, in these kind of interviews is that I do feel that it's the responsibility of former senior officials in government and probably particularly former intelligence officials to provide their perspectives to the public when they're done serving. What is it like when you are acting director, when you're actually sitting in the seat? It's a heck of a lot better than being deputy director. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ask anybody for permission. You just, you just do things, right? Right. I mean, one of the things you say in your book is that on, in the aggregate, we got a lot of things right and we got some things wrong. I think there's an alternative view of the agency that says we get a lot of things wrong and we get a few things right. In the, the broad scope of your 30-year career, like, why do you think the ratios are one way and not another? Let me give you an example. Right? I grew up on the analytics side of the agency and, and we produce the president's daily brief every day for the president. And in there, we probably make you know, 10, 12 analytic judgments a day. Right? Big judgments. And we look at whether those judgments turn out to be right or wrong. We look at those judgments a year after we make them, and we say, were we right? Were we wrong? Can't we tell yet? Right? And our batting average is 75, 80%, which is not bad, right? When you're, when, when you're trying to look at a world that somebody's trying to keep from you, or you're looking into the future, right? And having to make a call about what the future is gonna look like. What should the American public understand about the, the intersection of policy and intelligence? Right? I think the most important thing for them to understand, two things really. One is um, the real significance of intelligence to policy. When I look back at the history of the agency, when I look back at my time at the agency, when I look back at the history of the country, I can't remember a time when there's been more national security challenges and national security threats as there are today. And the vast majority of those are first and foremost intelligence issues. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can't understand the issues, you can't make policy, in many cases you can't carry it out without first-rate intelligence. A smart academic can give you real insight on Chinese politics, but a smart academic can't give you insight on where the, the, the Iranian nuclear program stands, right? You need intelligence to understand that. And then the other thing that's really important for the 
for the public to understand is that there, there is a bright red line between intelligence and policy. Right? Intelligence officers are not supposed to cross the line. Intelligence officers say, here's the, here's, the, here's the issue, here's how we think about it, over to you guys. Really important for intelligence officers to stay to the left of the policy line. Occasionally there are extraordinary circumstances like when the CIA was designing the campaign plan for Afghanistan, which was somewhat out of the traditional role uh, of the agency. So how do you like sort of calibrate? Where it gets a little murkier is with covert action. Mm -hmm. Right? There's three missions at the agency. There's the collection of, of secrets clandestinely, there's the production of, of all source analysis, and there's covert action. You know, covert action is when the president tells CIA, I want you to do X, Y, or Z in pursuit of a particular foreign policy goal, and I'm authorizing you to do that. Um, and you know, supplying weapons to the Afghan freedom fighters during the war against the Soviet Union is a great example of covert action. So when you're doing a covert action, the agency is often asked, how should this be done, right? So, so it's more likely in a covert action for the agency to lean forward and say, well, here's how I think this should be done. So since we're talking about covert action, I've, I've heard um, this sort of debate within the intelligence community about the agency's role, whether post 9-11 it's uh, swung into too much of a kinetic role, whether that be drones or covert action, and gone away from its mission of collection. Where, where do you fall on so, that debate? I am concerned, right? I am concerned that the, the increased covert action, particularly par paramilitary covert action post 9-11, um, is beginning or has begun to impact on intelligence collection. Why is that? Because the same people who do intelligence collection do covert action, right? And when the president, when the president says, I want you to do A, B, or C covert action, Congress sometimes gives you additional money, but they never give you additional people. They never say, we're gonna raise your, your ceiling, um, your hiring ceiling, and you can hire additional people, right? So we've taken on a lot of covert action over the years. Um, they, they're easier to take on than they are to stop. They're easier to start than they are to stop. Um, and so you've got a lot of people, right, who, who, who normally would be out there collecting secrets who are out there doing covert action. More than 4,000 U.S. soldiers were killed during the Iraq War, and tens of thousands more were wounded. Additionally, according to some estimates, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians died during the conflict as well. There can be no doubt that Saddam Hussein has biological weapons and the capability to rapidly produce more, many more. And he has the ability to dispense these lethal poisons and diseases in ways that can cause massive death and destruction. Morell admitted that the intelligence the CIA produced about Saddam Hussein's nuclear intentions and his vast chemical and biological weapons cache that paved the way to war was seriously flawed and the result of groupthink. He's one of the first CIA officials to come clean about it. Now he's apologizing for getting it wrong. About a third of the way through your book, you have a paragraph and it's, it's sort of heartbreakingly honest where you apologize to Colin Powell for getting the information that then he brought to the UN for getting it wrong. Uh, would you give the same apology to say a gold star mother like Debbie Lee, whose son Mark Lee was the first SEAL killed in Iraq. So, let me tell you why I did it for Colin Powell. You know, here's a guy who had a stellar reputation, who served his country extraordinarily well in a series of positions over the years, and deserves that stellar reputation. Quite frankly, that reputation was tarnished by what he, when he went before the UN and laid out the case, right? And then that case turns out to be wrong. Almost every part of it turned out to be wrong. You know, that, that was a big part of my thinking. And the other part of my thinking was that I knew that he had said to folks over the years, you know, nobody from the agency has ever apologized to me. And so that's why I wanted to apologize to him. Um, and I did send him the chapter um, before the book got published. And he called me. And we talked for about 45 minutes, and he was deeply appreciative of the apology. And yes, the apology applies to every single American. A huge chunk of Morell's book is devoted to the Senate Intelligence Committee's sweeping condemnation of the CIA's use of so-called Enhanced Interrogation Techniques, or EITs, one of the most controversial counterterrorism programs in the history of the agency. Remarkably, Morell, 
who worked in a senior position overseas during the height of the program, claims he didn't know anything about it until after it ended in 2006. Tell me about your involvement in the agency's detention and interrogation program. Well, I became aware of the detention and interrogation program when I became the number three, um, number three to Mike Hayden in 2006. I had a sense of, from what was going on around me that CIA had um, in its in its detention, senior Al Qaeda guys. There's both the there's the rendition and detention program. Well, right? there's there's three different programs, right? Okay. Renditions, um, which we did l well before 9/11. What is a rendition? A rendition is moving somebody from from the country in which they're captured to a country where they are wanted on some sort of legal charges, right? Commonly used in the Clinton administration, commonly used in the Bush administration, and President Obama said he was going to do away with them. He didn't. At the end of the day. The detention program is the CIA keeping senior al-Qaeda operatives in secret prisons around the world. And the enhanced interrogation program then is the use of harsh interrogation techniques to get information from these guys who you have in detention. So you really have to separate all three of these programs, right, when you look at them. Was it prudent, safe, legal, necessary, and moral? We're talking about the detention program? Detention. Um, I'd rather do that with the, with the enhanced interrogation program, right? Detention program, I don't think there's anything wrong with the detention program. In fact, at, at that point, Department of Defense didn't want these guys, right? So the choice was put them into a U.S. legal process where they would lawyer up and wouldn't say a thing or send them back to their country of origin where we wouldn't have access to them, right? And having access to these guys whenever you wanted it, being able to monitor what they were doing in their cell and talking about with their colleagues, right, really important to collecting intelligence. I have no doubts about the morality of the detention program. Uh, and let's talk about the EIT or Enhanced right. Interrogation Program. Right. It is really easy um, 13 years later to look back at this and have a certain perspective on it. It's much more important to look at the context of the times in which President Bush made this decision and George Tenet and Condi Rice made this decision, right? So these senior al-Qaeda guys were being captured. We believed that they had information about these threats to the United States, right? That if we could get the information out of them, we could stop these plots and save American lives, right? These guys were not talking. They weren't talking under normal interrogation techniques, and the counter-terrorist guys at the CIA came to George Tenet and said, we think we need to try something different. We think we need to try these techniques. Um, we think if we don't, Americans are going to die. Director Tenet was convinced enough to have that same conversation with Condi Rice, and the Enhanced Interrogation Program was born. Then the other way to look at this are the questions you asked, right? Was it legal? You know, was it torture? I don't like calling it torture, right, for one simple reason. Because to call it torture says my guys were torturers, right? And they were told that they weren't. They were told that what they were doing was legal. And I'm gonna defend my guys to my last breath when it comes to something like that. The Justice Department at the time said on multiple occasions, this is not torture, this is legal. You know, what you're doing is not a violation of U.S statute and not a violation of U.S. treaty obligations. The second question was, was it effective? Right? And here's where the CIA and the Senate Democrats are on a completely different page. The Senate Democrats say in their report that not a single piece of useful information came from this program. The CIA says a whole bunch of useful, actionable information came from this program that saved lives, stopped plots took additional senior al-Qaeda guys off the battlefield, right? Um, because I was acting director at the time that the CIA was putting together its response to the Senate report, um, and deputy director, I spent a lot of time looking at this because I wanted to make sure that what our response to the Senate report we could stand behind and was as rigorous as possible. I have no doubt, after spending months looking at this, that it was effective because I've seen I've seen the intelligence that these guys provided before enhanced interrogation techniques. It was not full answers to questions. It was not specific information. It was not actionable. After enhanced interrogation techniques, full answers to questions, specific information, actionable information. No doubt in my mind it was effective, okay? Then you get to a third question, which is, was it necessary? 
Right? It can be effective, but not necessary. You could have got it some other way. And the honest answer is we will never know whether it was necessary or not. And then you get to the most important question, right? Which the Senate Democrats never even talk about in their report, which is what's the morality of this? It can be legal, it can be effective, right? But is it the right thing for the United States of America, which stands for human dignity and human freedom, to undertake those coercive techniques on another human being, right? And it's kind of easy to look at that question and say, of course not, of course not. But there's another side of the morality coin, right? The one side is crystal clear, of course not. But the other side of the morality coin is, what's the morality of not using those techniques on a detainee if you really believe that you have to do that in order to save American lives, right? And so the question of morality gets really hard, right? And that's where the discussion should be. Right? That's, where the, that's where the public discussion should be here. And I want that discussion to be had, but I want it to be based on the facts. I want it to be based on a, a true history of this program, not what I believe to be a politically biased history of this program, which is what I think the Senate Democrats produced. What is the American public to think? Like, should they, you know, should they believe the agency that conducted these operations, or should they believe the oversight body charged with, um, with monitoring these activities? Right. Look, at this point, I think it's up to historians to sort all this out, right? I really do. But the other point I want to make about this, which is really important, it's really important for Americans to understand this was not CIA's program. This was America's program, right? Yes, the CIA conceived the program and carried it out, but it did so with the approval and the direction of the President of the United States, with the approval of the rest of the national security team, with the approval of the Justice Department, and with the approval and support of those members of Congress who were briefed at the time, both Democrat and Republicans. That makes it America's program, all right? So let's call it what it is, America's program. Now let's talk about it. The report released... A day before Morell's book was published, Senator Dianne Feinstein, the powerful California Democrat, who as chairwoman of the Senate Intelligence Committee produced the $40 million CIA torture report, issued a press release attacking Morell's claims that the interrogation program was effective and produced valuable intelligence. In her rebuke, Feinstein said Morell, one of the few government officials who had access to the full 6,700-page report, did not even read it. She doubled down a few weeks later with an unprecedented 54-page point-by-point rebuttal to assertions Morell made about the efficacy of the program in his book. At no time did the CIA's coercive interrogation techniques lead to the collection of intelligence on an imminent threat that many believe was the justification for the use of these techniques. Senator Feinstein obviously has been the biggest proponent of, of this retrospective look at the enhanced interrogation program. Um, and she's been critical of you. Uh, what is your relationship like now? So I had, you know, for the vast bulk of the time that I was deputy director, I had a terrific relationship with her. I mean, she is, she is for the most part, a strong proponent of national security and a strong defender of the intelligence community and a strong defender of CIA and a lot of CIA programs. Um, but we had a very good relationship. Um, I was very open with her, she was very open with me. That's how I know how she wanted this report to come out. She told me. And that relationship, quite frankly, got frayed when the CIA produced its response. It wasn't personal with me, it was that I was representing the institution that produced this report. I have not spoken to her since, since I left. Um, I am, you know, certain that she's not happy with me for going into the detail that I went into here. We reached out to Senator Feinstein numerous times to talk about Morell's claims and the torture report, but her office declined our request for comment. What can we learn from the last 15 years of your time at the agency that's going to inform us for the next five or the next 10? Two really important things, right? And this is one of the reasons I wrote the book. There's two problems that we have to deal with. One problem is those terrorists who have already been created have already been radicalized and who are trying to attack us and kill us. We have to deal with those individuals. 
and the, the lessons post 9-11 is the only way to deal with those guys is to keep the pressure on them at all times. When you take the pressure off, they start planning and they, they, they are successful in that planning. When you keep the pressure on, you degrade them, you weaken them, you make it much more difficult for them to attack us. So you've got to keep the pressure on them, right? And that means military pressure, paramilitary pressure, intelligence pressure. The second really important lesson is you cannot capture and kill your way out of this. In other words, the other problem that you have to deal with is how do you stop the creation of new terrorists, right? How do you deal with the radicalization problem of young men and young women around the globe, right, to this particular brand of extremism, to this ideology, right? And that's something that we have not done well as a country or as a coalition of countries in dealing with this problem. And it's not going to go away until we get our arms around that. Those are the two lessons. Mm. And from an intelligence perspective, where do we need to do better in the next decade than the last? From a collection perspective. This is an intelligence war. Right? My former boss, Mike Hayden, used to say that you know, in the Cold War, the enemy was very easy to find and very hard to kill. Right? He was talking about Soviet tank divisions in Eastern Europe. You could look through a satellite and see them, but you couldn't do anything about them, right? That's what he meant by that. In this new era of terrorism, the enemy is very hard to find, but very easy to kill. And by that he means not necessarily kill them, but you know, capture them or take them off the battlefield, right? The finding, the finding, which is the hard part now, is all about intelligence. So intelligence has to be really good in order to deal with the guys who are trying to kill you. Yeah. It's incredibly rare for a senior CIA official to speak candidly about the grave mistakes the agency made, some of which cost American lives and stained the U.S.'s reputation around the world. But at the same time, Morell, who retired from the CIA in June 2013, two weeks before the agency handed the Senate its response to the torture report, also left no doubt that he'll continue to vigorously defend the CIA from criticisms particularly criticisms that are aimed at discrediting the CIA's post-9-11 counterterrorism policies. Morell believes that the U.S. will be at war against terrorists for years to come, and he'll continue to consult about how the United States can defeat them. Thank you for coming.